Well, Microsoft has finally done it. They have shown us exactly what's going to be in the new Xbox Series X. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on GameRanks, Xbox Series X, the full specs revealed. So, yes, we're here at D-Day, or X-Day, or whatever you want to call it. This has obviously been the subject of a lot of speculation for quite a while now. And in truth, I'm pretty excited. Obviously, Microsoft is touting this thing as the most powerful Xbox ever, and why wouldn't they? It doesn't really make sense that your newest would not be the most powerful ever, but they have every right to because, well, it is. So without any further ado, let's talk a little bit about it. Now, obviously, the two most important things we need to talk about are the CPU and the GPU, and I think we're dealing with some good stuff here. Now, Xbox Series X is what they're calling the biggest generational leap of system on a chip and API design that Microsoft has ever done. AMD said the Xbox Series X is going to be a beacon of technological innovation leadership for this console generation and will propagate the innovation throughout the DirectX ecosystem this year and into next year. Now specifically, the CPU is built on top of the Zen 2 CPU. The one in the Xbox Series X is specifically an 8 core running at 3.8 gigahertz, 3.6 gigahertz with SMT. To give a little background on that, Zen 2 is a microarchitecture that follows up the AMD Zen and Zen Plus microarchitectures. It's a good architecture. It can actually deliver higher performance at a lower power consumption than the Intel equivalent and has a pretty wide range of different products. You can get a Zen 2 CPU from under 200 bucks all the way up to like $4,000. They're all generally high quality, and it's definitely a good pick for something more stationary like a console, on account it's flexible and well-known by a lot of developers. Now, the GPU, on the other hand, is actually pretty damn cutting edge. It's a 12 teraflops 52CU custom RDNA 2 GPU from AMD. And what's neat about that is this is stuff that we're not even actually seeing on the consumer market anywhere yet. It will be cutting edge when both the Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5 come out, both with RDNA 2 GPUs. So in all honesty, it's actually a really exciting console generation on account we're talking about graphics cards that deliver A, 50% better performance, or at least theoretically so, and B, ray tracing out of the box. Just to go ahead and say this, as far as light simulation goes, to have ray tracing pretty much basically capable in every single game starting this console generation on, just by default, just a thing you can call on in the hardware of the computer, that's great. Because as wonderful as lighting can be in gaming, a true light simulation requires ray tracing. Light is rays, and ray tracing is a means to reproduce how rays would work. And knowing that this is basically the standard we're coming from going in, I'm extremely excited to see where we go as far as this console generation's graphics. Also understanding that console development often kind of places some limits on PC game development, it's quite nice to understand that in the coming years, those limits may not be as hindering. Now some of the demos we saw for ray tracing included Gears of War, Minecraft, and these are significant changes in what it looks like. This isn't to say that Minecraft is a game you desperately need ray tracing for, but it's still very cool to see what it looks like that way. But it's Gears of War 5 where some really interesting things are seen. The lighting is just significantly better. It's not even close. Surfaces act so much more how you would expect them to act. That's great. That's exactly what we want to see. Now, we have some alleged specifications for the PlayStation 5, and if they are correct, the PS5 is not quite as powerful as the Xbox Series X. Now, it's kind of important we understand that these are not confirmed specs, they are consensus based on information, but the belief is that the GPU in the PS5 is going to be running at 11.6 teraflops, which is not a lot less than the Xbox Series X. We're kind of talking about an area where it's 0.4 teraflops of difference, so it may not actually really be that much of a difference, but there's a supposed other leak that says it is running at 13.3 teraflops on this GPU. So keep in mind, there is conflicting information out there. It may be more powerful, it may be less powerful, but even if it's at the higher estimate, that's 13.3 teraflops, it's not a huge difference. However, graphics aren't the only thing that's vastly improved on this version of the Xbox, of course. It's definitely cool to talk about, but 
One of the bigger improvements, I think, was in load time. Now they showed off a tech demo of State of Decay 2 loading 40 seconds faster on the Xbox Series X. And I know that 40 seconds doesn't sound like a lot, but if you sit here and watch the tech demo where you can see the other player walking around doing things while the Xbox One X player is not, they're just looking at a load screen, it seems like a massive improvement because let's just be frank, it seems like forever watching these two load screens next to each other. It's obviously very relative because 40 seconds in the scope of a full day isn't a long time. However, it's a big improvement. This comes to us partly because they've moved over to an SSD, specifically a one terabyte custom NVMe SSD, but also because of a couple of elements of its architecture. For instance, having nice, very speedy memory, 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 with a 320 byte bus, 10 gigabytes of that memory has a speed of 560 gigabytes a second, 6 gigabytes, 330 gigabytes a second, and it has IO throughput, which is how fast it can transmit data through the console, at 2.4 gigabytes a second, raw, 4.8 gigabytes a second compressed, with a custom hardware decompression block. Now, a lot of that doesn't mean a whole lot to every single person out there, and that's perfectly understandable, but the best way to sum it up is they've built a machine that will absolutely run very quickly. It will not seem sluggish. Load times are going to be nice and fast, as demonstrated, and in truth, it's pretty exciting. Now, one terabyte sounds like a lot of storage, but if you remember back to the PS3, the 60 gigabyte model seemed, wow, that's a lot. And even during the course of that generation, PS3 models of up to 500 gigabytes were eventually made. Storage moves quickly, it's easier to fill up than you would think, and requirements are constantly expanding. Although, we did cover that pretty neat AI texture technology a few weeks ago, and that could end up helping quite a bit. Still, we have both the capability of expanding the storage through a one terabyte expansion card, the expansion card being another one terabyte custom NVMe SSD, meaning it's not something that would slow your games down. As far as external storage goes, however, there's a USB 3.2 external HDD support. However, it's not just, hey, you can use a 3.2 hard drive however you want. It really has to do with the fact that you can use Xbox One accessories on the new console. You'll be able to use external USB hard drives to store and run Xbox One and Xbox backward compatibility titles. You will be able to store Xbox Series X games on these drives, but you won't be able to run them without transferring the game to the internal drive or one of the expansion slot drives. The expansion slot drives are at least a little bit flexible despite being proprietary in that you will apparently be able to swap them between systems so you can copy a game to them and take it over to a friend's house, at least. And to some extent, I do get why they wouldn't be letting you use a regular hard drive. It is going to impact the amount of time spent loading if you were to load off of a hard drive. But on the other hand, it's not great to know that it's really inflexible and proprietary. Now, as far as the optical drive goes, I don't think anybody's really going to lose their mind over the fact there's a 4K UHD Blu-ray drive in it. It's certainly not a bad thing, but I would think it's pretty standard at this point to have something like that in one of these, especially while the United States internet infrastructure is not necessarily ready to give everybody 60 gigabyte downloads that don't take a full week. Or in the cases of a lot of rural areas, just a completely impossible thing. It's not going to happen. You're not going to download something that's even a gigabyte. Those places still rely very heavily on disc media. Yes, there are still gamers in the United States with 56K dial-up modems. It's real. What I would say is that for those people, it's very good that optical media is still being considered as an important thing. Although I would speculate there is another way that games could be delivered. In theory, if you had an expansion card, you could take that into the store and load a game onto it there. Does that seem like something that's super likely? I don't know, again, I'm speculating. But the idea of an expansion card that you can remove and that performs exactly like the SSD does open up some possibilities for people who don't have the internet to download games in the way that I mentioned. We'll see if that's followed through on. We also got to see exactly how the thing is manufactured, which is pretty cool. They're using two main boards and the Xbox Series X actually pulls in air through the bottom and pushes it out the top via a 130 millimeter fan. Honestly, in a lot of ways, it's like a computer, but it does have its own unique design cues. Now, as for the controller, there's not a lot different at first glance. However, there are some tech improvements. 
For instance, it now features a USB-C charging port, which nothing shouldn't at this point. Further, it has Bluetooth low energy support, so it should be easier to pair the controller with PC or Android or iOS devices. Beyond that, you'll be able to use the new controller with the Xbox One console. It will work with current Xbox One accessories like the chat pad, and although it is for the most part very similar, there are a few design cues you can tell the Elite controller has leaked into the regular controller bit here. I'm talking probably most specifically about the D-pad, kind of combines the regular and the elite D-pads, as well as has a technology called dynamic latency input, which what it does to reduce latency is to A, send more information to the game system, and B, sync that information with specific frames. It's also got a share button like the PS4 controller. I, of course, think that's a good idea. There's no reason not to have that on a controller nowadays. Overall, very minor improvements, but that USB-C, let me just go ahead and say, I'm very happy they've moved to that standard. I'm really looking forward to playing this thing. It's a very cool machine that under the hood is going to be a formidable competitor in this console generation. But what do you think? Are these specs enough? Do they wet your whistle? Are you satisfied? Leave us a comment, let us know. If you like this video, please click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week, and the best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription. So click subscribe, and don't forget to enable all notifications. As always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.